We begin our new series on the overview of the Old Testament, and tonight we'll be in Genesis through Deuteronomy. And so I asked you to turn your Bibles to Genesis. It doesn't mean that we'll be begin in verse 1 and, and go through, but we're just going to uh, peruse through the whole books as I give you an idea of what each book is about. You know, there's a, a famous quote that um, actually has been put uh, all over the place, bumper stickers, shirts, and so forth. And I used to have a shirt uh, that, that basically had the word Bible written on the side and then the acronym on, uh, as each letter uh, went by. And it was basic, inst- basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth, and that spells out Bible. And how true that is, that, that we have the Word of God and it instructs us in, in the basic things of life and how we should live on this earth to have peace and rest and even joy in our lives before we enter into the eternal state it's called the word of god from genesis to revelation and it is an awesome word i i love the word of god it it is uh, such a amazing book that it transforms lives completely uh, I have in the front of my Bible, I, I, I write all over it. I've got sticky, uh, sticky post-its all over with notes and things. But I have the, uh, a note on the front of my Bible that's all in red. And, and everything that's in red is, is about the Bible. I mean, I, 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 I broke it down to, to verses. I mean, I, I just saw this and I thought this is a, a wonderful thing to know about the Bible. I don't know why it's a wonderful thing to know about the Bible. But in, in the Old Testament, there's 33,000 Two hundred and one words or verses in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, there's seven thousand nine hundred and fifty-nine verses uh, in the New Testament itself. So that means there's a forty-one thousand one hundred and seventy-three verses in the Bible. Now, who needs that information? I don't know, but that's how much I just love about the Bible. There's just so much in- interesting information for us to grasp from it. I'm just thinking uh, that's forty-one thousand words that God spoke to us or verses that he spoke to us that he thought were important for us to hear and not just hear but to apply for our to our lives as we live on this earth I know that men speak less than women and women probably speak even more than God at least 60,000 words a day uh, women speak and men probably speak like maybe 5,000 words a day (laughs) and you know that's true too so uh, they've actually uh, given statistics of that (laughs) Ronald Reagan said this, within the covers of the Bible are the answers for all the problems men face. Now, is that true? It really is true. If we would to search out the word of God, you'd be amazed at how it would take care of your problems when you begin to apply them. And so these books are are wonderful books. The first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These are the first five books uh, of the New Testament. And these books are divided into five. And that's why we call them the first five books of the New Testament or the Old Testament. We also call them the books of the law. We call them the Pentateuch. Uh, Some have called it the Torah. But basically, they're really one book divided into five. And so they've broken it up for us in that manner. So you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, if you want to memorize that and you like pictures, just think of this for a second. Think of a genie floating on a leaf, okay? And he's floating here in the church, and you see that he's floating out a door that says exit uh, on the uh, top there, like when you're exiting a door. And now you have genie for Genesis, the leaf Leviticus, and then you have Leviticus, and then he's writing in a book, the Pentateuch, and he's writing Numbers. So the book of Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then as he's going out, there's a teacher with her bun little thing, and she's got a little ruler in her hand, and she's the the substitute uh, teacher for Deuteronomy. And so it gives you a picture of those first five books there, and you can remember them. Now, they comprise approximately one-seventh of the entire Bible and are almost two-thirds longer than the New Testament, just these five books. So tonight, we're going to look at the books of Genesis through Deuteronomy. First, the author. 
I can probably say this right across the board that the author uh, of the first five books is Moses himself. And I'll probably repeat that as we go through, but I'm basically going to give you an outline. So we have the author of Moses. On several occasions, the Lord commanded Moses to write down various things, especially in Exodus, not in Genesis, because Moses wasn't around in Genesis. Uh, The Old Testament goes as far back as um, 2,000 years, but maybe even a little bit further back than that. But we know Moses wrote the five books of the Bible in probably around 1500 uh, century and so 15 150 100 and 1500 years before Christ came where Moses wrote it because that's when his ministry started and we see a lot of quotes in Exodus like Exodus 17 14 says then the Lord said to Moses write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of the Amalekites from under heaven so he directs Moses to write these downs and of course at the recount of Joshua means the time of Deuteronomy when we wrote that book and then handed it over to Joshua and then also we see uh, 24 4 where Moses writes all the words of the Lord there numbers 33 2 now Moses wrote down the starting point of their journey at the command of the Lord and so there's references to him writing the book and so most scholars believe that Moses wrote the books the first five books. Uh, well, how did he write about Genesis? That's the question that you might have. There's an interesting chart that we have, and I was looking for it, and I couldn't find it. But it is a, a, a age chart of each individual. So it starts with Adam, and it tells you how old he was, and then it goes to the next person all the way down Seth, and, and, and all the way to Moses. And, and I believe, if I'm correct, and you have to look at it, that Adam lived all the way to Noah, And so Noah knew Adam. And then when you look at Noah's lifespan, Noah lived to where Moses. And so Noah could have told Moses exactly what happened in the Genesis account because Adam told Noah exactly what happened. So that would be like me telling my son about my life and then him just telling his son about my life. So it's just firsthand almost first-hand information, so it's that clear. And of course, uh, we can't discount the, the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Who always ministers the truth to us too. So in Exodus 24, it is said that Moses uh, read the book of the covenant, that is the first five books, which he had um, just completed. Now, as I said earlier, the period of writing is around the 15th century. Uh, you can see that on the timeline yourse- yourself, and you can see that Exodus is around the 1500 B.C., And then uh, Genesis uh, 2000, and then maybe even uh, later than that. So what type of book is this? It's a book of law, and the Jews consider it to be the book of law. And and when we get to Numbers and um, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we're going to see that there's going to be a lot of laws, a lot of regulations that the priests had to follow and the people had to follow. And this is the first book of the Pentateuch or the first division of the, of the book. Now the theme in Genesis, uh, we can clearly say that it's the beginning of all creation. Uh, just from start in chapter 1. That God created and everything that he created was good. Do you realize that? that everything that God created was good? It was good. Though we're sinners and we have inherited Adam's sin nature and we have a tendency of sinning and we still sin yet God created you and it was good that he created you and he created you with a plan and a purpose what is that plan and purpose for your life how much time have you spent with Jesus trying to figure that out trying to find out you can spend a lifetime figuring out what God wants you to do and never find out I really believe that what God wants you to do is take a step of faith you remember when the children of Israel were going into um, Jordan and they were having to cross the Jordan River to get into the to promised land. Now this is the second crossing into the river and God told them that he would open up the river but they first had to step into it first and then he would open it up and it meant that they needed to take a step of faith and so they began to step in it and it was getting higher and higher and higher and began to get a little high and they thought okay what's going on here and then finally the Lord opened it up and sometimes we just have to take a step of faith Uh, Chuck has always believed and I think I shared this on Sunday it's not ability 
It's availability. It's being available to what the Lord wants to do uh, in your life. And, and when you take those steps of faith, ventures of faith, and you just move forward, God then will begin to lead you exactly where he wants you to be. And so just take that step of faith because he created you uh, with a purpose. He created you for a reason. And so it talks about all creation and all that he created was good. The beginning of the Hebrew nation, uh, Israel, and of course uh, that nation is still around today. Now the word Genesis in Hebrew means beginning. And so we're right at the beginning, the beginning of uh, the Old Testament books. So, so Genesis in the book of beginnings, the beginning of creation, the beginning of man, the beginning of sin, beginning of God's plan for the redemption of sinning man all starts right here. And, and, and if you can believe Genesis, then you shouldn't have a problem believing everything else in the Bible. Because right here is where it starts, where it says in verse one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, plain and simple. Uh, you can't read into that. You can try to. You can, you, you can try to bring out some things, but it's very simple that in the beginning, in the beginning of time, back when it started, it was God that created, and that is from nothing, the heavens and the earth. It was God. That's a miracle. That is a great miracle. You have to have a lot of faith to believe that something exploded and then began to create something. That takes more faith than anything else because that seems so impossible because you would think that that, that could happen today at any time, any moment where something could explode and start another little planet or another little earth or so forth. Um, that, that just random acts uh, uh, just of burst starts life. It doesn't make any sense. But to say that God created, that makes a lot of sense because I know I can create. I know that I can create artwork I know that I can create masterpieces of, uh, of uh, wood and so forth. Of course, you wouldn't think so, but I would um, because I have done it. And you have seen some of the masterpieces that men have created, whether it was cars, whether it was pictures. And, and you say, that makes sense, that, that, that nothing comes from nothing, but someone can make something from nothing to take a canvas and then put a, a beautiful picture on there, a Mona Lisa, and, and now it's worth millions and millions. You know somebody created that. You look at a vehicle and you know someone created that, and it makes total logical sense. But the world says, no, that doesn't make any sense. And the reason that they say that is because they really don't want to live for God. They really don't want God in their life. And so they have to just throw it right out. It's just amazing how their logic is. It just doesn't make any sense at all whatsoever that they would. Today, you see what's going on with the terrorists and ISA and the tolerance that they have towards the Muslims and the intolerance that they have towards Israel. I guess some, some Muslims just killed uh, a, or a, a Muslim tried to kill a bunch of people and Israel killed the guy. And so instead of coming down on the Muslim and the terrorist group, the UN came down on Israel for killing the guy because he was Muslim. And there's this mentality that here are people that have been so oppressed and neglected that we need to let them express themselves, you know, and just leave them alone and let them do what they want, you know, while we should be more tolerant and acceptant, I guess even giving up our lives according to them. So it's just crazy how this logic is out there and it makes no sense at all. It makes sense to us that it's wrong, but to them, I think it does. And I think they're just playing games. They're just outright lying and deceiving the population out there. Well, let's look at uh, a couple of chapters here in Genesis. As I said, it's the beginning of man. It's a story of man. You have Adam in the beginning and how God took him from the dust of the earth. And then he, what, breathed life into him and then took a rib from his side and he created woman to come alongside him to be his helpmate. Everything that we need to really know about life starts here in Genesis. Uh, you can almost, You can almost answer most of your questions by going right here in Genesis. 
It's pretty amazing. How am I supposed to treat my, my wife? Go right here in Genesis. How am I supposed to love my husband? Right here in Genesis. How, how am I supposed to treat my, my boys? Right here in Genesis, and, or my girls too. Right here in Genesis. And you, you see it all from the very beginning, and you see God's heart right here. You can almost answer all your questions just from the first three chapters of Genesis. It's pretty amazing. Oftentimes when I start thinking of things, I just go, well, let me go back to Genesis and see what it says. And you'll usually find the answer there. So we have the creation, we have the fall of man, that man sinned, sin entered into the world, and of course God had to take care of that sin. Then we have the story of the flood with Noah, which is an amazing story that just can blow you away. I mean, take an airplane flight over the Grand Canyon and you just see how the water could have, could have just been all over the earth and how the water could have flowed down into different channels and so forth. You know, they try to use the Niagara Falls as evidence of evolution and erosion but in reality if you can imagine a total global flood you can see how Niagara Falls were created because Niagara Falls actually if, if I'm correct here uh, the falls is coming down but it's 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 higher on this side so they're they're kind of thinking how can it ever erode that like it, there there was if not there was just more water you know and it just doesn't make any sense how they they, they try to figure that out but if there's more water and of course, as the water's coming down, then it's going every which way, creating hills and, and so forth. But they won't accept that as good science. So. But beautiful story there, and I think there's a lot of evidence there in Noah. And then we have, of course, uh, the Tower of Babel, where the, the tongues were divided you know, among the nations. Um, God dividing them because they were trying to be like a God and so forth. Um, the story of Abraham, another beautiful story, the beginning of the children of Israel, the Hebrew people. Uh, Abraham who lived in uh, the land of the Chaldeans and how God called him. And I was thinking about that today, how God called him. Uh, Abraham uh, wasn't seeking God for a calling, uh, wasn't trying to force God to call him. Abraham was just living his life and God came and says, Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation of you. Leave that land and go into a land that I promised to give you. And then when you start thinking about that now and you can see other instances on how God calls, for instance, Paul, what was Paul doing when, when God called him? He was persecuting the church. He was on his way to get some more Christians and all of a sudden God, what, blinds him. And so you see God calling Paul, but Paul wasn't in a way seeking God. So one of the aspects of God's call in your life is that you're not forcing it. If God's called you to be a pastor, an assistant pastor, an elder, or a deacon, or to be in leadership, it's not forced. God will call you, and you can't do anything else, because Abraham went. Even though he disobeyed in the real, little rebellion and took his family with him and took Lot and so forth, which later on became a thorn in his side, and even though Paul you know, was killing the church, uh, Paul followed. They couldn't do anything else. Because once God's called you, once God has a hold of your heart, you're going to persevere through whatever it is uh, that comes at you because you know that God's called you to do something great. You see that with Peter, and Peter put his foot in his mouth so many times. You see that with Moses. Moses went and called, uh, God went and called Moses, of course, Moses and then Joshua and, and you see God always going down and calling men not men going to uh, Christian universities and then deciding this is the career that I choose because someone else chose it or because you think it's going to be a great career or you think you have a great gift of speaking and so forth it doesn't work that way God will call you uh, to the ministry and so a beautiful story with Abraham. Of course, we have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Isaac and Ishmael, um, the story of the beginning of these men, uh, Jacob. Jacob is another story. I love Jacob. Jacob, uh, I can relate to him, uh, which means surplanter, uh, deceiver. Uh, him and uh, his brother, uh, Ishmael. Is it Ishmael? Yes. And Jacob, they, they both were fighting. For, for their positions and places, you know, and Jacob deceived him uh, and his father p uh, pretending to be Ishmael and then uh, Isaac, um, ga Isaac gave uh, Jacob instead of um, Esau, that's right, Esau, which means red, <clears throat> the, um, the birthright. But here's what's interesting about Jacob. 
is the word Jacob means a planter. And there was a, a, a time when God and Jacob were wrestling. And God ended up touching the, the shank of his hip and crippling him, humbling him in a sense. And he changed his name to Israel. And I always thought that was so fascinating when I was studying it, it that it was interesting because Israel means ruled by God. And so what God was saying was, you are Jacob in the flesh, but I've called you spiritually to be ruled by me. So I call you um, Israel, Israel ruled by God. And, and when you watch Jacob's life, you can see the times where, where he was just being obedient to God and God would call him Israel, Israel, Israel. But then there were the times when Jacob was in control. He was in the flesh and you could see it so clearly when he was in the flesh. And what I find interesting is that God loved them both. Whether, they were, whether he was in the flesh or whether he was in the spirit, God called him and loved him. Whether he was Jacob or whether he was um, Israel, God loved him, and just like he loves us. And we have two natures too, don't we? We have a sinful nature, and we have a spiritual nature. And oftentimes our flesh gets in the way of the spirit. Uh, the one that we feed more is the one that uh, will obviously overpower the other one. But God still loves you just as much as, as he did in the very beginning. And even in your rebellion, even in my rebellion, God loves us and that is amazing grace it's grace that is so powerful that it just changes an individual and it will not allow you to stay in a place of rebelliousness it is amazing how God's spirit will take hold of you and humble you and he will put you through things to get you right back where he wants you in his grace so it is an amazing grace that God has for us. Even when we're a Jacob in the flesh or we're Israel ruled by God. So another beautiful story there. And of course it ends with, with Joseph uh, itself, which when you read the story of Joseph, and this is what's amazing about the story of Joseph, it it's relates and points so much to Jesus. It's Jesus' story completely. Uh, Joseph... Jacob's son was not liked by his brothers. He was despised. He had a coat of many colors. His dad loved him. Uh, Jesus was loved by his father uh, dearly. And all of Jesus' brethren, Israel, and the religious leaders hated him. The religious leaders persecuted Jesus. Joseph's brothers persecuted Joseph. They sold him into slavery. The Judas Iscariot sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Jacob then became the um, ruler to Potiphar, which then saved his brothers from starvation and giving them life. And then Jesus went to the cross and died for the sins of the world and then later ended up saving uh, Israel itself and, this, and those that uh, put their faith and trust in him. So it's a beautiful story when you read it from Genesis 37 to chapter 50. Uh, great book. Usually everyone loves the book of Genesis. I know I, I've loved going through it for years and years. It's when you start getting into Leviticus, you know, and numbers that you just kind of uh, doze off in a sense and close the book for a while. Then we come to Exodus. The author, Moses, period of writing roughly about 300 years after after the book of Genesis we have the beginning of the book of Exodus where Moses began to write in the 15th century and again it's a book of the law Torah the Pentateuch the second book of that Pentateuch and I guess the theme here and you probably already know this is the deliverance of Israel from slavery right out of Egypt and it's very clear because all the way from from uh Exodus chapter 1 through the rest of it is all talking about that deliverance out of Egypt. Now what I have done, and just in your own reading, you might want to do this, I don't know. Uh, I've done that, but every time I've read a chapter at the very bottom, I'll just put chapter 1, and I just put Israel growth. You know, just kind of give it a theme. And then um, 
Chapter 2, I put Moses is introduced. Chapter 3, Moses meets God. Uh, God tells him, I am who I am. And just a little footnote at the bottom of my Bible, so it gives me an idea of what's going on in that chapter. I've just done that throughout the years. Quick introduction to Exodus. Exodus is a continuation, and I think every book is a continuation of, of, it, of the last book uh, of Genesis, and it begins with the story here of Moses himself. It's named after the cent- central event event in the book when God delivered Israel out of the slavery of Egypt. This event marks the birth of Israel as a nation or a theocracy. This took place immediately following the covenant there at Sinai. You remember when Moses took the children of Israel at Mount Sinai and then God made a covenant with them with the Ten Commandments and that's when they became a nation. Now theocracy basically means a form of government in which God or a deity is recognized as their supreme ruler. And so God has always wanted to be the ruler. When you look at Genesis, God created man and man walked with God. God was ruling over him. And so God always showed that truth. Jacob, I'm going to rule over you, ruled by God, Israel. Then we get to to uh, exodus and god again is reminding them that i rule over you i am your god and then when you start getting into the historical books the people want someone else to rule over them and so other nations are being ruled by kings and so israel asked if you remember in in uh, samuel he he asked they asked we want a king just like the other nations and so they chose saul to be their king of course that's not what God wanted and so God chose David to be their king but ultimately God wants to be the ruler of Israel and he still wants to be the ruler of Israel today when you get to the New Testament we have no ruler who is our ruler who is our God who is our shepherd it's Jesus Christ and he rules over every single one of us there's no one above us there's no king there's no president you know, it is God and then it is us as individuals. He is the one that we are to love with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then we love one another as we love ourselves. And so God brings it all the way back to having a personal relationship with him just like he did uh, with Adam in, in the garden there. So he always wants to live uh, in harmony with us by his uh, great ruling abilities as our God and so the theocracy that's really the true government that God wants to establish and he will establish that again uh, later on when all of this is is over and he begins to rule during the millennium reign that's going to be awesome because he'll rule and we're going to be under him and we'll be reigning with him for a thousand years now the chapters or the book of exodus is is presented in two main parts Uh, chapters 1 through 19 tell the story of God's rescue of the children of Israel from Egypt and in a mightily way I mean all the the miracles that took place just to get them out of Egypt into the promised land Uh, and the one that just blows me away probably more than any other miracle is the one when they're at the Red Sea that just always blows me away that God is able to uh, save them and it's always at the last minute when, when they're panicking you know, and they're sweating and they're complaining to their leadership, Moses, you know, so you brought us out here to die. Might as well dig our graves right now, you know, and God the whole time is showing himself in the cloud by morning and the fire by night, you know, he's there right there where they can visibly see that and yet they still are doubting because Pharaoh and his chariots are coming right at him and there's the water and so that's it, we're done. It's over, uh, Moses, thank you. We could have been alive as slaves for the rest of our lives and kind of like we are sometimes when with things. Uh, we think it's the end. I know I always think it's the end and um, yet God still has more, more to do. Amazing. And so it, it brings us uh, right to the place of, of Mount Sinai. And then chapter 20 through 40 describes his covenant with them of course the mountain top and he comes down with the 10 commandments we see one of the stories there is is the story of Korah if you remember reading the story of Korah and and uh, Aaron <clears throat> uh, them fighting over who's going to be the leadership uh, and God had called Moses 
And then um, Korah stood up against him, and so Moses didn't defend himself. He just let the Lord do it. And the Lord opened up the earth and swallowed Korah and everyone else because they stood up against his leadership. So don't stand against me because God will swallow you up. <laughs> I'm just playing. I don't mean that. He won't swallow you. He loves you. But there is something to say about that. I mean, there is something to say and to think about. 30 years of doing this and every time someone comes up against leadership or murmurs and complains, you know, they, they either are just sitting and they're put on a shelf and they're not doing what God's called them to do. And that's sad. <clears throat> so, giving of the Ten Commandments, obviously the, the most <sighs> pivotal point in, in the life of the children of Israel, the, the Ten Commandments that are even still used today. Of course, not in our government because it's against the law now, separation of church and state. And they're so fearful of us that they have to wait till the middle of the night to remove the Ten Commandments in Oklahoma. Otherwise, it would be great protests, but they just did that this last week as, as a final poop. We're going to get you out of the, the government completely. So, But the Ten Commandments are still around, all the way from loving God to... Um, bearing false witness against your, your neighbor, uh, those beautiful commandments of God that, that condemn us, really. They really condemn us, don't they? They tell us we can't keep it. We can't keep the law. Uh, we can't love God. We can't stop stealing. We can't stop lying. Uh, we find that we break those commandments all the time. So they're a reminder uh, to us that we are guilty. And I think that's why they've tore them down, because when they read them, they realize every time they pass by, love God with all your heart, my, oh, I don't do that. Thou shall not steal, you know, thou shall not lie. Ooh, they just found all the emails that were hidden in this place and over here, and now they're finding out that there's all this other stuff, and who knows now, as Hillary Clinton's in major trouble, possibly gonna go to jail. You know, and then they don't wanna see the Ten Commandments that say don't lie, you know, don't cheat, don't steal, and so forth, because it's so convicting. And they know that when they're convicted, they know that they are... Um, going to be judged by God. And again, period of writing, 15th century, book of the law, the third book of the Pentateuch. Theme, there are four themes which are very important in the theology or the study of divine things or religion, truth or divinity of Leviticus. <clears throat> I'm sorry, this is the book of Leviticus, by the way. <laughs> so, Turn your Bibles to Leviticus. We're just running through this really quick. Now, this is a book that ev I don't know of any person that does not complain about the book of Leviticus. I've never heard one person say, I love the book of Leviticus. It's like I'm ready to read it again. Usually everyone says, I hate it. That's usually where they close the book up and put it on the shelf because they can't stand it anymore. I personally, I love the book of Leviticus. There is so much in here that it's, it's amazing. Um, <clears throat> I was just reading today, Leviticus chapter 15. Do you know that the Bible has scientific facts in it? For instance, remember there was a time when doctors used to wash their hands in bowls of water and then they would do their operations, deliver babies, but they had a, a really high death rate until they realize what? That they should be washing their hands in running water? Well, Leviticus 15, check it out. God says in there, run your hands in running water. You know, the ones that are thought to be sick and diseased, make sure you cleanse them with running water. You know, so, I mean, the evidence is just right there. So it is a beautiful book, a book of law. Third book of the Pentateuch. Uh, it talks, as I said, about theology, divine things, religious truth, divinity. Um, the presence of God himself with the Leviticus, the holiness of God, the sacrifices of God there, and even uh, the covenant at Mount Sinai. We find God's desire to fellowship with Israel and his instructions to live a blessed life. Um, since Adam and Eve had sinned, uh, they'd broken the law. God then had to restore them to fellowship, and so he established this Old Testament system by which they can reestablish that relationship with him and so he began to establish sacrifices substitutes in a sense uh, for his son Jesus Christ that would come later on uh, in, in the future uh, he 
direct them to take an animal, to lay their hands on the animal, to put their sins on him just like our sins were laid on Christ and then send the animal out. And as far as the east was from the west, they don't see the animal anymore. So our sins are forgiven in the New Testament because of what Jesus has done. And so sometimes they would slay the animal. And so then our sins would be, their sins would be uh, covered. They would have restored relationship with God until they sinned again, and they'd have to go through the process again. So it's, it's a beautiful book of the substitute sacrifice of the animals. And it's interesting how the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ and what he was going to do. It never saved them. It only pointed them to the one that would save them. Uh, the one that would come and ultimately be the sacrifice for the sins of the world. Uh, They could only look to the future and and not to the present. And it wasn't until the disciples uh, walked with Jesus and they could actually see the presence and see what God had done through through his son Jesus Christ on the cross. And what do we do today? We look, what, to the past. We look back to what Jesus has done on the cross and that's how we were saved today so it's a beautiful book the word leviticus means pertaining to levites and so it is a uh, laws that pertain to the levitical priesthoods how they were to conduct the sacrifices supervise over the worship and so forth so um, they're in the temple of god Uh, when they approached god that was their duty And, and it speaks a lot to those that are pastors this is where we we get the idea that pastors are not to uh drink um, at all they're to be set apart uh, consecrated unto the lord as these priests because they approach god on your behalf and by the way <clears throat> this is the moses model that calvary chapel um, has ha- has taken as their model for the church like moses who ruled over the people and god ruling over moses so we do at calvary chapel god is the head we are what we would call an under shepherd and then we lead the the body of Christ from that point. God was the head, Moses was that um, under shepherd and then Moses then selected men to help him to guide the children of Israel and part of the groups that were selected were of the tribe of Levite. They became the priest of the children of Israel. They didn't have an inheritance in the land. They were to live from the other tribes And what they gave as they maintained the temple, as they taught, as they uh, offered up the sacrifices, uh, did the ceremonies, entered into the Holy of Holies on their behalf and and so forth. So it is a a beautiful book. Uh, There is so much in here that it is amazing. Uh, The kind of sacrifices we see in, in, in verses one through seven, beginning the beginnings of the priesthood in chapters eight through 10, uh, the, the cleansing process by which uh, they would take things that were unclean and how God would make them clean in chapters 11 through 16. And then the rules for daily living. There's, there's some beautiful rules there for daily living, how we treat one another and our neighbors and so forth. Even today, there's a scripture in there that, that I use and, and other pastors have even asked me because I've mentioned it before where the scripture is. I don't remember where it is at this moment because it just came to my head. I'm sure I have it marked here. But it talks about, it talks about a man lying with a woman and that if she becomes pregnant, that they are to marry and never divorce. That's what Leviticus says. And so I use that in my biblical counseling or guidance when I talk to young couples and if they're having children, you are to be married and you're never to even mention divorce. You're stuck with each other because of the choices you made. It's biblical. And so um, great daily living stuff. You're stuck with each other like that. So learn to live together. And then we have, of course, in chapters 26 or 27, the, uh, the, the blessings and the curses and, and how... Um, God pronounced them to the children of Israel. If they did this, they would be blessed. If they didn't do this, they would be cursed. Then we come to the book of Numbers. <clears throat> Again, the author is, is Moses, around 1500. Book of the Law, the fir- fourth book of the Pentateuch. And in the book of Numbers, it's, uh, I guess we could theme, give it a theme of the tragedy of unbelief because it was in the book of Numbers that Israel was supposed to go into the promised land, but they ended up wandering for 40 years because of unbelief, unbelief. 
Uh, you remember the story, the spies went into the land and they were giants. You know, and they talked about the crops that were huge there, but the giants were, were big and there's no way we can take those uh, giants. And so it should have taken them four years to enter in, but ended up taking 40 years and the whole generation had been wiped out and a new generation had come in and then they went into the promised land. Uh, I thought about that also today as I was, I was studying about um, numbers here a little bit, uh, how God just wipes out a generation, then a new generation rises up. And that has to happen. That happens in churches all the time. Uh, when I gather with other pastors, uh, once in a while that topic kind of uh, comes up where we start talking about how our churches are constantly changing. People are coming and going. People are coming and going. People are coming. Going. From the big ones, uh, you know, thousands, to the smaller ones, people are coming and going. Uh, all of a sudden they get to six, 7,000, then they drop to four or 5,000, and they go back up, and it's just people coming and going. And it's like the unbelief, the, the wandering in the wilderness. They haven't rooted themselves in a place yet for whatever reason, and there's a lot of reasons uh, that, that can cause someone to, to not root themselves. And that's why it's so important to root themselves. And there's a point where in Numbers where, where Moses had to remind them where they came from because this whole new generation forgot. Their parents didn't tell them and they were gone. And so Moses had to remind them of where they came from. And we have to do that and that's why what is consistent, at least with Calvary Chapels, what is consistent is, is the leadership because God calls the leadership uh, to a place and not necessarily to a church or another church. I had a friend that was um, in the Assemblies of God and he must have moved to three or four churches within the time that I knew him. And the pattern usually is is that you begin a, a your pastorate in a small church because they don't know you yet and you're just beginning. And then you prove yourself and there might be some growth. So a bigger church loses a pastor. So they go, uh, we'd like to hear you. Maybe come out to our church. And so you'd move over there. And now you have a little bigger church. And so the goal is eventually you're taking over a church that has 6,000 people. And so the pastor is the one that moves around. And of course, what happens there is you, you have the shepherd that's constantly moving. He really doesn't care about the sheep. Uh, he's more concerned with his career. You know? And I'm not saying that all of them don't care about the sheep, you know, but their career plays in, into the, all of that. Where with Calvary, God calls you to a place. I remember when I first started this ministry and I wanted to be a Calvary chapel and um, they wouldn't allow me to be one here and so they asked me to, to cal be a Calvary in Norco, which there wasn't one there at the time. And I declined because I said, I'm called here. I'm not called to Norco. Can you imagine me in Norco? <laughs> I can't even see that. And so I declined and we just became Rupa Valley Christian Fellowship for you know, 13, 14 years, just trusting in the Lord. And of course, uh, the patience and the perseverance, you know, all that just eventually it just pays off. God's timing isn't our timing. It's all about him and what he wants to do because it's the Lord that adds to the church daily, not me. That's his responsibility. My responsibility is to be faithful, to teach the word, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, and then to allow him to work through the sheep because sheep beget sheep. That's how it works. Pastors don't beget sheep, right? Right? You understand the shepherds? You know, they go out there and they shepherd the sheep. And they can beget sheep. So sheep beget sheep. That's your responsibility to, to spread the word, not mine. I don't know how many times people have put it on me. Well, it's not growing because of you. It's like, that's not my job. That's your job, you know. But it's not even your job. It's the Lord as he adds daily because it's about you being excited, you being, uh, being uh, in a place where you know God's called you. And, and so you want to see that place grow and, and do a work for the Lord in these last days so now we come to <clears throat> the book of Deuteronomy again Moses 1500 uh, except for a few verses at the end where, where Moses kind of hands the baton over to to Joshua so we believe that Joshua probably wrote 
those scriptures. I love Joshua. I'm not going to touch on Joshua, but Joshua is one of my favorite books. The Lord has spoken to me through Joshua chapter 1 in so many ways in my calling. In fact, you can see the calling of God there in Joshua, how God calls a man, and then how the leadership acknowledges that call, and then how the people acknowledge that call, so you knew that you're called of God. So it was an interesting book. But we're not in Joshua, we're in Deuteronomy. The period of, uh, of the writing, again, is in the wilderness between Egypt and the promised land. They're still trying to get to the, through the promised land, and they don't get to it until, until Joshua. The book of the law, and it is the last book, the fifth book of the Pentateuch. And, and in Deuteronomy, it's about love and obedience, love and obedience, which it's what it is today, right? It's about loving God and being obedient to God. John says it, I don't know, three, four, five times that if you love God, you keep his commandments. It's pretty clear that obedience is evidence of your love for God. Obedience to his word and what he has said, uh, not what you think he's saying. I remember a story of a young man going to the pastor and, and saying, I'm, I'm really struggling. Uh, I'm struggling with God. I just don't know. <laughs> I don't know if this is the right God. I don't know if I have the right God. You know, I just uh, lacking faith or whatever it is. And he began to explain to him all these things. And the pastor said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, I don't think that's the right God at all. You've got the wrong God. I agree with you. He's the wrong God. That's not the God we serve. And it's not about what we think God should do. It's about what God says he'll do. Not us. He's in charge, not us. Uh, We are servants. We're here to serve him. We're here to reflect that light and salt to the world and in our relationships. Um, We're to be simply obedient to him because he loved us first and so we want to love him back and those two go together they go together so lord lord did we not do this and do this but yet it wasn't about them doing what they wanted to do it was about doing what god wants you to do he says yeah but you didn't you didn't uh keep my commandments you didn't do what i asked you to do remember when the disciples asked jesus what should we do to be saved and what did jesus says believe just believe that's it And so having faith in Jesus Christ, believing in him, and then just being obedient to what he's called you to do. The word Deuteronomy means the second law. Now why the second law? Because Moses reminds the children of Israel concerning the law of God. It's his final address to Israel. What has happened is at this point, I think Moses should have gone with Israel into the promised land, but because he wasn't obedient to the Lord, he missed out on the promised land. And I mentioned it Sunday. You remember when, when God told Moses to, to smite the rock because the children of Israel were thirsty, and so he hit it, and water gushed forth. And then the second time, he told Moses, speak to the rock. Well, Moses was a little upset, and so he hit the rock again, and God reprimanded him because he should never have Uh, done that he should have just spoke to the rock because christ needed to be crucified once and once was enough but moses misrepresented and that's what god said you've misrepresented me you made me look out to to be mean or angry at my people and i'm not and that just that blows me away even in their rebellious state god loved them very much there was a time you remember when moses and god were speaking as he was coming down well, your people are down there. Look what they're doing. He said, oh, they're your people. You know, they're going back and forth. But, you know, you, you see the, the love of God for his people when he, when he disciplines Moses. You can't go into the promised land because you misrepresented me. You misrepresented me. There's a pastor recently who um, had to step down from his ministry. He's a great speaker, a Calvinist, but great speaker. But he had to step down because he was just so mean in the ministry he was just mean and if guys weren't doing what they were supposed to do he said get out of here i got other guys waiting in line to do it i mean he would just fire them like that and 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 so that kind of um got known and it got out the word got out and so people started looking into it next thing you know he just decided you know what i need to i need to just step out of this and move and he ended up repenting and turning from that and so because it's a misrepresentation of of who god is who God is. Now, I'm not talking about men, because, you know, I could look at myself and say, have there been times where you've, you've had to be stern? Yeah. 
Yeah, there's been those times. But I'm not like that all the time. <laughs> it's only those times when it needs to happen. You know, me and another pastor were talking yesterday and we were just talking about some things and, and he goes, I'm normally not mean. <laughs> so then he's telling me the story. And I'm like, man, you're mean. He goes, well, if I have to be, I'll be mean. <laughs> I go, no, I, I, I totally hear you. I mean, there's times where you have to be stern. But to be like that all the time, right? It's a misrepresentation of, of who God is because God is loving. And I was really ministered to yesterday at our, our meeting because God is loving and he does love you and he cares about you. And the Lord ministered to me because sometimes I get up here and, and I go, where is everybody? And I apologize to you for that because you're here and so I'm so glad you're here you know I'm glad you came to hear me I don't know why you even came to hear me but you did and so I appreciate that you came and I need to change that because I should be grateful for what God has brought and not what he hasn't that's between him and them and I should be grateful for you to come out on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning and sit and listen to me try to teach the word of God um, that's the proper view to have because God loves you and, and that's a good representation of who he is. He loves us all. So love and obedience. Uh, the word Deuteronomy means again, as I said, second law. Probably covers the last month of Moses' life. He lived to be 120 years old um, <clears throat> before uh, the Lord uh, hid his body in a sense, if you remember that, he had to go hide his body. And the reason that he hid it was so that Satan didn't know where it was because you see that in the book of Jude where um, Satan was looking for the body of Moses. So in these chapters, we have, as I said earlier, the, the review of, of the history of Israel, um, the b blessings and curses, and then the transition, uh, handing the baton from Moses to, to Joshua. And then Joshua taking it from there. It's interesting. I was reading a, a book and it was talking about the Torah and the prophets and the Brit Hadish, which talks about the Jewish culture that every Saturday morning in synagogues all over the world, a Torah scroll is ceremonially removed from the ark, carried through the aisles to be touched reverently by the congregant. Uh, the custom symbolizes devotion to the word of God and then places on the bamich or the pulpit. And so they do this every Saturday. They, they take the Torah, the roll, and they kind of go around with it and everybody touches it because they're excited about the word of God. Isn't that beautiful? We should be like that about the word of God. We should be excited about it, to be able to open it up and to write in it and read the words of God himself to us. It's a beautiful book. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word, Lord. It's so profound, Father, and yet so simple, oh, Lord. May you just continue to touch our hearts, Lord. Continue to work in us, Father. I pray that you would take this overview, Father, and, and just kindle a little fire in our hearts, Lord, to, to read more of your word, Lord. You know, these wonderful stories in the first five books of the law, Lord, and the history and the worship, in of God and in the Proverbs and Ecclesiastics and Song of Solomons and the major and the minor prophets who wrote uh, directly from the mouth of God uh, what you were saying to the children of Israel, Lord. An amazing book, Lord. There is no other book like it, Father. It's a book of power, a book with authority, Lord. May you bless your people, Lord. <clears throat> you love them. Bless them, Lord God. Bless them, Lord. That they would know that it's from you, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.